Yeah. 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 So this is a twenty four karat gold piece right here, and uh, it's kind of a one of a kind. We did thirty of these golds, and the thirty that we did were way more over the top than this one. Even it had, uh, they all had a black lacquered piano finish, so they looked like a baby grand with the wood, and then a Japanese mother of pearl design on the side. It had custom purple LEDs for the back panel and the front panel as well as some custom LEDs. Uh, these actually. Uh, it went for about $15,000 each and was sold out pretty much right away. Uh, Dead Mouse bought one, as well as a lot of synth collectors. A lot of the guys who buy stuff like this, they may have a mini mode or 10 mini modes or something, um, but they like to get collector's editions, limited runs, so we do a lot of that stuff. Uh, of course, we make them in different colors. We do a white mini mode. This is an all aluminum cabinet down here. It's the first non wooden cabinets we've ever done. Um, these go for about four thousand dollars. We're doing a hundred of them, and then limited runs of the Black XL. Uh, that's the standard uh, ash cabinets there. We do a wide range of kind of cosmetic uh, one-offs. We've done chrome mini modes for Chromio. Uh, we've done a uh, an all Braille version of one of our synths for Stevie Wonder. A purple little fatty for Beyonce, um, all sorts of stuff like that. Cool. So these are the burning racks, and then they're going to be calibrated right over here. So the burn-in racks are a way for us to essentially weed out bad parts. With analog electronics, if something's going to fail, it's going to fail right away within 24 to 48 hours. So we leave them on for a couple days, run voltage through them, and if something's going to fail, it will, so that when we go to calibrate it, it will have already failed as opposed to it arriving on your doorstep and failing. So um, in here, we're going to calibrate each and every mini mode that we make. Two guys calibrate every single one we sell, and um, they spend anywhere from two to four hours on each and every one. Uh, if you guys want to all come forward so you can see, that would probably help. Um, you're also welcome to step in there and check this out. So we've got oscilloscopes in there. We've got a computer for all the digital data. The board in the back is all exposed. This is all open. And if you want to see the circuit board, um, please, please go ahead and check that out in there. Um, there's the analog board is exposed on that board. You got about 30 different calibration points. So there's tiny little boxes with a little screw or knob type thing, and they need to be turned just a millimeter or two left or right after it's all assembled to make sure that it sounds perfect, it's in tune, that all the waveforms are correct. So this is a there's a lot of love and care that goes into kind of breathing life into the circuit board after it's assembled, and all that happens in this room. Um, and if anything has failed at this point, it'll get swapped out. Every key, every knob, dial, fader, everything on it is going to get a full inspection uh, before it gets shipped. Uh, cool. So we're going to head this direction now. That is where we make the mini effects pedals on this line over here. If you're curious about those, those are really aimed at guitarists. They're also very affordable in the $150 price range. You can still build them right here. Uh, they're still fully analog and signal. Are we waiting on a few guys?
So this is the newly redesigned Theremin. It's a Theremini. We call it that because it's very lightweight. Uh, this antenna comes Whoa. right off. Pull that off. Throw this in your book bag. It weighs like three pounds. Super lightweight, very portable. Has a built-in speaker, so uh, you can take this Ooh. out wherever you're at, play it. Uh, headphone out as well. And this thing is really cool because it's kind of a theremin for the rest of us who don't have perfect pitch or 10 years to learn how to play one. It's got a pitch correction knob, which you can turn all the way up, and it's essentially like training wheels for your theremin. Now, the cool thing about it, you can pick your root note for your scale. Say you're playing in C minor, and then you just hit the scale button and you can change all the modes. There's different chords, there's all sorts of options there. Let's see what we're playing in. Uh, we're in B Arabian, or no, C sharp Arabian, whatever that means. And uh, so now I can only play the notes in that scale. Makes it a lot more musical, a lot more playable. Um, and the cool thing about this is if you're over the whole training wheels thing, you can turn it down. Um, so in this mode, it plays like a standard theorem. And I've got the vibrato option there too. Um, so a lot easier to play. Pretty much anybody can play this thing. To demonstrate, would you play this for us? There you go. Awesome. Let's give this guy a hand. What's your name? Uh, so really easy to play. Very musical. Also, for the more advanced of us, we've got USB MIDI out. So this can be a controller. This can play other synthesizers, software synthesizers, control your computer, your laptop, that kind of thing. Um, $2.99 is the street price on this. We just started shipping these like a week or two ago. Um, we are struggling to keep up with the demand. They've been very popular so far. So you guys are one of the first public groups to actually see this instrument in production. Is that fully analog as well? Nope, it okay. is not. It's the first, uh, the first digital oscillators that we've ever... It's based on the Animo gap. By the way, if you want a Moog synthesizer and you don't have deep pockets or you don't have the budget for it, you can get one on your phone for nine bucks. It's called Animo. A-N-I-M-O-O-G. It's great. It's, it's an award-winning synth. And you can get it on your iPad for 30 bucks, and it is phenomenal. And basically, the sound engine for that app is what's in here. So you've got built-in effects, you've got an analog delay, uh, a filter, all sorts of, uh, of really juicy stuff in there. Cool, so we're going to move in this direction. So this is the sub fatty line here, and you can think of these as a lot more portable, a lot more portable mini modes. This one goes for under a thousand dollars. It sounds great. It's a great bass synthesizer. It's a super awesome first synth too. If you were looking to get into synths and you wanted something that you could kind of learn and grow with, but also not be kind of overwhelmed by, this would be a good synth for you. Um, all the knobs on the front panel have access to all the parameters, so there's no sifting through a computer screen to have to change the sound. It's all done on the front panel, even if you didn't know what this knob did, by turning it and playing one key, you're going to know intuitively. So a very simple synth to operate. Um, has a sub oscillator here, so if I'm playing a C, I can turn the sub oscillator up and I'll also be playing the C below it, which is great for bass lines and that kind of thing. There is a sub fatty coming out in the next couple of months. We're just about to start making them. 
It's going to have 37 keys, so a little bit bigger. It's also going to allow you to play two notes at the same time. Now, it doesn't sound like a big deal, I'm sure. But here's the thing. With uh, analog synthesizers, this being one, I've got this section here. These are the oscillators. They create the sound. And so this whole section, just for one note at a time, right? And if I wanted to, let's say, on this synth, play, let's say, eight notes at a time, so lots of chords, that kind of thing, I need eight times three oscillators. So you've got three oscillators. So I need eight times this section with the accompanying circuit board behind it. I need eight filters, so eight times this section, and eight amplifiers, so eight times this section. So this instrument would be like four or five times the size, four times the, the cost. It would be a large, heavy instrument, basically. So it's not as easy as in the digital realm to play to make a quality line. So our new synth, the Sub-37, is the first synth in 30 years that we've made to play more than one note at a time. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we'll keep moving along this direction. later, the strings are going to stop vibrating, so you don't hear the guitar anymore. Well, with this thing, you can turn up the sustain knob, strum the strum a chord, go on a vacation, uh, <laughs> raise a family, take out your retirement, come back in 60 years, and as long as you've paid your bill for your electricity, that thing will still be making the sound, and the strings will still, still be vibrating. So how does that happen? Well, you've got this analog circuit board in the back. It's got over 3,000 components on it. And on the front, you've got two pickups with magnets built in. So uh, the strings are, of course, made of metal. And with magnets, you can control magnets and electricity. You can control how much energy um, you can pull it or add it to the strings to keep them vibrating. And so that's exactly the way this works. A uh, local guy, Paul Vo, invented this technology. If you're curious about it, he just created a kit for your acoustic guitar which gives you infinite sustain, but beyond that, you can strum a chord and it will cycle through the notes one at a time as rapidly as you want. So it's an arpeggiator for your acoustic guitar. It's pretty innovative and a lot cheaper than buying the whole thing built together. It goes for about $1,600. His name is Paul Vo, P-A-U-L-V-O is his last name, uh, Vo Creations, and the instrument is called the Vo 96, if you're curious about it. Check that out. Um, in here, we have the service center. It's the only service center in the entire United States. And um, actually, let's take a let's take a peek in here. Yeah, if you just go. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, no problem. So, uh, like I said, this is the only service center we have in the entire U.S. Now, keep in mind, there's probably a hundred thousand or more Moog instruments that were made in the last few, uh, I don't know, ten years or so. So, there's a lot of synths and effects of ours out there. Not a ton are coming back for repairs. I guess. At any given time, we've got 20 or 30 here for repair. We've got some for modifications and tune-ups and that kind of thing. 
We've always got some sort of a celebrity synth here. Last week, we had three of Kanye West's synthesizers, but we've had everybody since you can imagine. Uh, this is one of these analog boards that I kept mentioning. Mm -hmm. And this is the one with over 900 parts on it that we use in the mid mode that is responsible for most of what you hear. Now, when I was talking about... Uh, I believe it, think so. Um, so when I was talking about calibration points, these are what I'm talking about. These are actually hand, uh, hand attached, I guess. Nick, are they soldered? Uh, these calibration points. How yeah, are they attached? They're, soldered. they're hand soldered. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so all these different calibration point points are what we fine tune when we calibrate them, and uh, a lot of different tiny little diodes, transistors. Um, all these little components on here. And so this is what creates the sound. When you hit a key, voltage travels through the circuit board and uh, you're hearing the sound of electricity dancing around in all the different sections there. And so this is kind of Bob's, this is where Bob's focus was on designing. Uh, he really understood how electricity flowed through these. So these, these are the old school analog electronics that I'm talking about here. And then we have a mini mode from the 1970s. I think it's a 74 model, that one, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the original one. Uh, that's the mm -hmm. instrument you hear on the Michael Jackson Thriller album, as well as Parliament Funkadelic records, jazz albums, and rock albums, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's actually open there on the back, so you can see the electronics in there. Um, the story is that Bill Hemsap, one of Bob's engineers, stopped taking his lunch break and started working on a prototype for this, all of his own free will. And basically, he would pull parts from the scrap heap. So he pulled a scrap heap keyboard, got some wood, pulled a few modules, and just started putting them all together. And he was able to convince Bob that this was a good idea. And of course, this was the first commercially successful uh, synthesizer that Bob really put out. It's the first synth you could ever buy in a store. And it was also a lot more portable than this big um, behemoth modular sense, so uh, it made it kind of a perfect, perfect fit for touring. Uh, cool, so we're going to head out this direction. 